Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our Freshwater Stewardship Community webinar. My internet is not the best today, so you'll notice that I'm just off camera today, but you might recognize me from my voice from previous webinars. My name is Monica Seidel. I'm the Communications and Fundraising Manager at Watersheds Canada, and we're very pleased to have Dr. Simonovic here with us as our keynote presenter. We're going to go over just a bit of housekeeping for today and then get right into the presentation. So in the back wings of the call today is Nicole Dubé, which is Watersheds Canada's Freshwater Health Coordinator, and she's going to be doing all of the behind the scenes. So if you have any questions for our Q&A at the end that you would like to submit privately, you can do so by messaging her in Zoom. And if you're having any tech questions or questions about Watersheds Canada's programs, you can message her as well throughout the presentation today. If you are not familiar with Watersheds Canada, we are a national charity that's headquartered in Eastern Ontario. We focus on freshwater stewardship and education programs. So you can see two of our habitat restoration programs highlighted on the screen here. On the left, we have the Natural Edge, which is a shoreline restoration and planting program. And then on the right, we have a spawning bed enhancement that happened just a few weeks ago, where we're working with community groups to restore historic spawning beds. And then in the spring, so around now, the water will obviously melt. And so the spawning bed will be restored as the rocks fall into place. We have a number of other programs that I won't get into today, but if you are interested in learning about our programs that are delivered nationally and how you as an individual or a community group might be able to get involved, I encourage you to go to watersheds.ca forward slash our hyphen work. A couple of quick practical ways that you might be able to get involved with some of our programs this spring and summer. The first is our Natural Edge program, as I mentioned, Shoreline Restorations. So we work with different community groups across the country to help property owners, municipalities, and community groups restore shorelines. And so we do this through our starter kits. Watersheds Canada, as I mentioned, is headquartered in Eastern Ontario, and so that's where we deliver our planting program, but we also work with partners in different provinces, and so they're trained up and are able to do the site visits and the plantings as well. So if you are a shoreline property owner interested in possibly having a site visit this summer and having someone walk your property with you and talk about different things that are maybe happening that are threatening the health of your shoreline property or you're just looking to add some beauty and habitat to your shoreline, you can email Chantelle on our team and she'll be able to point you in the right direction for different free resources and site visits. So you can email her at naturaledge at watersheds.ca. Another way that you might be able to get involved as a community group if you are in central eastern Ontario is by submitting a letter of interest for our fish habitat program. So we deliver our program. You can see the little photo here. It's our in-water restorations with woody debris piles. And so we are currently accepting emails of interest for these projects to happen either this fall or in 2025. So if you are interested in learning more about woody debris, how it's beneficial to the lake community and especially to different fish species, you can do so by emailing Melissa Dakers, who is our Habitat and Stewardship Program Manager, and you can reach her at info at watersheds.ca. One more practical way that I'd like to highlight today is our Symbolic Adoption Program. So this is a way for individuals who maybe don't have a waterfront property that they can't be restoring or they don't live on a lake where they can be restoring the habitat, but they still care about this ecosystem and the animals that live there. And so a way that you can still partner with Watersheds Canada is through our symbolic adoption program. Each of the symbolic adoptions includes a five by seven postcard with artwork done by a Canadian artist and it highlights different habitat features or species that your donation will benefit. And so we can put your a donation towards habitat materials or resources to help Canadians across the country 
protect our lakes and rivers. So you can learn more about our symbolic adoption program and what options are available by visiting watersheds.ca forward slash gifts. The program that we are here for today is the Freshwater Stewardship Community. As many of you probably know, we have been running this community for a couple of years now, and we have quite the library that's archived on our website. We have hosted 47 webinars since 2021, and we also have an accompanying handout or family activity sheet that goes with each of those webinars and all of those can be accessed on our website so the page that you went to to register for today's session is the same one you just scroll down to the bottom of the page and there are a couple of different menu boxes that you can click through based on different themes and so all of those resources are free they are able to go as far and wide as you think they would be helpful if you have a community group that you can post these resources in or you have a newsletter that you send out to your lake association all of these resources are free and available for you and you can access them at watersheds.ca forward slash freshwater hyphen stewardship so these are some of the boxes that you will find if you scroll down on that page you click through and then all of the webinar links and the handouts are there for you we have one final webinar for our spring series this year. It will be happening next Thursday, April 11th. The title is Crash Course, and it's going to be looking at the different threats that our migratory bird species are facing and how we as individuals and as communities and municipalities are able to take action to help make their journey back home successful. And so we'll be joined by Safe Wings Ontario, or sorry, Safe Wings Ottawa, and they will be giving that presentation next week. So you can register for that again at watersheds.ca forward slash freshwater hyphen stewardship. But for today, I'd like to just introduce our speaker. So Dr. Seema Novik is universally acknowledged as one of the world's leading authorities on application of systems analysis to water and environmental management. He advanced the understanding of water and environmental systems by providing decision makers with tools to support their sustainable management. He provides unparalleled contributions to global and local management of water that have improved the lives and livelihoods of millions of people worldwide. His work has a significant impact on our understanding of system linkages between humans and built and natural environments that lead to sustainable water resource management and resilience as a new developed paradigm. So with that, I will pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Monica. <laughs> I hope I can share my screen. Yes, you should be able to take over. Thank you kindly for the invitation to share with you a little bit of my experience. Uh, today, we'll be talking about floodplain mapping and one kind of special approach which uh, takes into consideration very large spatial scales. I like to start my presentations with conclusions. Um, so uh, in this particular work, for the first time, we use the latest climate modeling projections for understanding the changes in floodplain regimes over the over the Canada. Uh, uh, some of the findings are that the near and far future 100 year and 200 year flood events um, will add to a rise in the high and very high flood hazards. Simply with uh, the changing climate, increasing frequency and magnitude of floods is something that's expected, and our work did show that. Flood frequencies in the far future will increase in different locations in Canada in different uh, to different extent. Uh, during the presentation, you will have a chance to see a few maps. And in order to make this modeling approach much more useful to general public, uh, we developed a communication tool or communication instrument, basically a website that contains all the maps developed uh, that I will try to I will try to demonstrate. 
I'll start very briefly with the motivation for this work and then spend a little bit more time on trying to explain what these maps are for. Um, and I'll end up the presentation with possibly live demonstration of the tool that can show these maps. Climate change is expected uh, to affect flooding. Physics is relatively straightforward. Uh, the warmer um, atmosphere has larger capacity to store the moisture. And with that, uh, we are expecting uh, more rainfall, um, larger events to happen more frequently. In 2021, uh, finally, IPCC, through different uh, reports, uh, recognized after the review of very large number of references that there is a very strong connection between the climate change and extreme weather. And uh, that was present also in the thinking and decision-making of our government, uh, where, as you can see, um, the gov government committed considerable uh, amount of money over the 12 years in order, to, in order to extend the disaster mitigation and adaptation fund and also another uh, another pot of money uh, that will be used and it's being used by Natural Resources Canada, Environment, Climate Change Canada and Public Safety Canada to work with provinces and territories to uh, finish flood mapping for high risk, high risk areas. Uh, Flood inundation mapping over the large regions is, um, is a very specific task. And it's quite different from traditionally what we consider to be flood plain mapping, because usually this is done on a, a much smaller spatial scale where we combine the kind of hydrological and hydraulic modeling uh, in order with other you know, topographical and other information in order to it, identify how uh, much land will be inundated and what will be the water depth and different locations. When you look at the very large, very large areas, um, this kind of hydrologic and hydraulic models are not as powerful and they cannot easily capture the differences that may be occurring at, the, at every location. So that was the objective of this particular research that led to the work that I'm presenting here. Um, basically to develop the methodology for high resolution flood inundation analysis over the very large regions. Our focus was clearly on, on Canada. Uh, we also in that process investigated the utility of the publicly available data. And as you will see a little bit later, the methodology relies on the uh, this public information, uh, on, uh, sorry, global information and if this global information is publicly available, that I think gives additional strength to the uh, to the methodology. We use this particular work to investigate the changes in floodplain regimes across Canada. We identified the changes in flood inundation extent um, to find out the change in the flood hazards and to identify the change in you know, kind of flood frequency. The work was funded by Canadian <clears throat> Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, ANSERC, through the collaborative research grant with the ins reinsurance company, Chaucer. A uh, number of people participated in the work. You can see my collaborators listed, um, are listed on the slide. Here is the summary of the uh, methodology. What you can see is that the Basically, in order to develop these maps on the larger, uh, for the larger regions and uh, on that kind of global scale, we usually uh, rely nowadays on the so-called global flood models. There is explosion of these kind of global flood models today. Um, Glow Fris is one, List Flood from UK is another one, Kama Flood uh, from Japan is the third one. The Kama Flood model is the one that we used. Uh, these particular models are, you know, kind of utilizing uh, the storage cell approach for routing uh, the flood water through explicit final difference procedure in a kinematic wave approximation. Kama flood or the model that we use, uh, uh, its behavior is based on establishing a relationship between the water storage, water level, and flooded area 
through the parameterization of the subgrid scale topographic parameters. The main input into this type of models is simply runoff. So we base the methodology on the publicly available runoff information. Uh, this type of databases are called the reanalysis databases. They're combining the observ observations of the runoff together with um, mathematical tools to extend and provide um, longer sequences of information that can be used in further analysis. There are many different models, uh, reanalysis kind of models, uh, European, uh, North, Amer North American, and so on. They have their own characteristics, and they all, all have now the information that started in 1979 and up to the present moment. So because we were focusing on developing the overall methodology and in the same time looking, you know, what kind of public data will be the best to use, at least for the Canadian conditions, we performed the analysis utilizing four different uh, reanalysis models. They are then runoff obtained from these models is plugged into the Kamaflad, the global uh, global model. Kamaflad model includes the digital elevation information, the hydrologic information, the water network, all as layers that are already provided together with the model and the input uh, runoff input process through the model ends up in the. Uh, <clears throat> I am sorry in the uh, simply water depth, uh, velocity, and, and uh, inundation inundation area. Uh, the resolution, uh, the spatial resolution of this uh, kind of modeling approach is approximately 30 by 30 kilometers, which is, uh, which is small when you take the size of the country and the areas where the global models are being applied but large for you know using this information in the flood uh, decision flood uh, management therefore we introduced one more step after processing and obtaining this information from the comma flood model to downscale the information to one by one uh, kilometer scale spatial scale and create the flood inundation maps at that uh, um, that resolution this is exactly what the user of the tool that I'm going to demonstrate will see. Uh, basically, the, the, the grid distribution of flood um, extent and water depth and velocity on the one by one kilometer spatial scale. So this methodology or the application of the methodology starts with downloading the runoff information from different reanalysis products. At the station locations where we have the observation, we did a very rigorous comparison between observed and reanalysis runoff values uh, using the correlation and other um, statistical, statistical measures. Then um, the statistical fitting of the theoretical distribution, in this case, we used the generalized extreme value distribution was done to the data. In order to help us uh, in this analysis, we extracted 100 and 200 year at the beginning. And then as you will see, we now have a very large uh, number of different maps starting with the 25 year, 50, 100, 150, 200, 300, and 500 year return, uh, return periods. This gridded information is fed into the Kama flood model to derive the maximum flood depth and inundation extent uh, for the whole country. And that was mapped and provided uh, to the users for their uh, consideration, use, and applications. Downscale, downscaling is done at the end before the maps are developed uh, before the maps are uh, created. And this was um, done, as I said, to bring the information to one by one kilometer spatial resolution. So what do you get at the end is something like this. Uh, obviously, this is a very large, <laughs> a very large scale. This is this is showing the 100 year floodplain map of Canada uh, in the GIS tool. You can zoom in uh, into uh, uh, into the region of interest and come down to uh, resolution and scale that will be of interest to you. 
that was a very fast walk through the methodology. Um, I was hoping to spend a little bit more time on demonstrating how you can use these things, but in order to uh, help uh, help potential users, I think it was necessary to go through the uh, background methodology in order to understand how the maps are developed. And uh, here I'll try to review what these particular maps are for. I think the first um, the first kind of objective, the first purpose of uh, you know developing maps, uh, applying this global methodology, uh, is to understand the overall flood hazard across across the country. Um, as you can see, um, these are very high, uh, you know, very small maps. Uh, but uh, what we have uh, done is for each location in Canada, the grid one by one kilometer developed a presentation of the maximum water depth that can kind of very easily give you immediate uh, immediate impression of what the flood hazard across the country is, what are the regions of the, that deserve the higher attention, as well as do some kind of summary analysis and find out what is the proportion of the country that's under the higher uh, flood hazard risk and you know what are the areas that are under the lower and so on. The second possible application is basically to integrate the map that we had previous that I previously showed with some additional socioeconomic information. In, in the maps that are right now on the screen, we combine, for example, the population density using the census, uh, census, census divisions with the flood maps in order to identify, for example, what is the percentage of the population uh, that's exposed to uh, high, high flood hazard. Uh, the colors are obviously identifying the areas of, you know, from very low to very high uh, exposure. And I think very quick, very quick uh, view uh, of, of these maps is very clearly showing that the areas where the higher population are are seriously <clears throat> affected also by flooding, um, potential flooding, and therefore, therefore the flood hazard is pretty pretty high. Some summary numbers are that you know approximately uh, three million people uh, live in the flood hazard areas uh, if you are considering uh, the current or the historical information. With the change of climate, uh, the inundation areas are expanding and water depth is increasing and therefore the larger population will be exposed to these hazards. So you can do many similar type of analysis by simply utilizing the maps developed for, um, you know, the previously described procedure developed for uh, identifying the flood uh, hazard, inundation, velocity, and depth, and other socioeconomic information that you would like to kind of uh, associate with that. The third uh, very important uh, uh, application, and that was uh, that was actually. Um, the major <laughs> objective and uh, reason why I think we obtained the funding uh, for this work was to uh, see how can we look a little bit ahead and try to assess what the climate change will do to flood hazards across the country. So uh, on the right hand side of the slide, you see the little bit modified procedure from the original one we are basically the top input that in the in the in the original case was uh, you know based on observation and uh, uh, the data that are kind of available uh, through different reanalysis products with the runoff information that is now predicted by various climate models. We utilized uh, the really most recent uh, climate information from so-called the coupled modeling comparison uh, intercomparison project six, uh, CM, CMIP six, where 17 different global climate models are considered, all models that are providing the runoff uh, information because our methodology requires as input uh, runoff data. Climate models are run for various emission scenarios. Um, so we utilize two of them. One is a kind of medium range of future uh, forcing pathway. And another one, this is a SSP2 and SSP5, which is a high range of 
future forcing pathway to kind of see uh, what will be the difference and also generate um, generate the maps uh, and flood, identify the flood hazard um, that may be consequence of these various scenarios. We also consider three different time frames: um, historical, near future, and far future. You can see the uh, the years here. Historical was between 1980 and 2020. Mm -hmm. Near future 2020 to 2060. Uh, far future 2060 to 2100. Each of them, uh, each of them uh, uh, is considered or the data was used for two different emission scenarios. So we had very large number of runs of the flood model, comma flood model uh, with runoffs from these different climate models for different time periods and for different emission scenarios. Comma flood model uh, was not changed. It was used in the same way as uh, with the historical data and the reanalysis data. The final information is downscaled in the same data and the information or the maps were generated just for these different uh, different uh, variations of input inputs. So these are the type of information that you can derive uh, through this uh, particular task of finding out what the climate change impact is. Uh, in this particular table for different uh, <clears throat> temporal periods and different emission scenarios, uh, we analyze the percent change in the, in, in the flood inundation for various river basins across the country. You can very easily see that the high red, um, which is indicating pretty significant change in the inundation, is dominating, uh, dominating some of the regions. And therefore, these will be the regions where probably much more detailed analysis, a traditional analysis of the different temporal and spatial scale uh, should be done to further, further analyze the impacts. The second, um, the second type of <clears throat> information that comes from this is also the flood depth um, and hazard. And this can be mapped across the country, as you can see. These different maps that I am showing are basically for different return periods and different uh, different emission scenarios and different periods. But for all the periods that I identified at the, uh, the previous slide, and all emission two emission scenarios and all return periods, uh, these maps are available and produced and made available for uh, general public. Uh, beside the flood depth and hazard, we can show also the change in the uh, flood frequency. And this is an interesting slide um, um, showing for 100 year return period and uh, mid range emission scenario and 200 and high range emission scenario. And you can see how the red color is, uh, you know, overlapping with areas where most of the Canadian population lives, um, indicating that much more frequently we will be facing pretty significant uh, flooding in these different uh, in these different areas so all this information the methodology and the information and the ways of using this particular methodology uh, um, have in my opinion very low value if you cannot share these results with the kind of general public and communicate these results to the general public so what we have done um, uh, to deal with this, we extended the project on our own to basically present all the information uh, that was generated through the project in the form of the relatively easy, friendly uh, web-based tool. Uh, the tool web page is uh, presented here. Uh, the address uh, URL address is here. The www.floodmapviewer.com. And what I'm going to do now, I'll stop my presentation, um, log in into the tool and try to basically demonstrate for you how uh, this tool can be used to review the information generated uh, using the methodology that I quickly explained.
Can you please confirm that you see the screen? Yes, you're good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is exactly the what I was pointing out. You can see the address here. I logged in into the tool. Uh, tool is organized in a you know, kind of um, natural way of investigating something and showing the maps and so on. So you have options here to first kind of explore the maps. You have options to learn more about the methodology and also uh, review the publications that are providing details. You have a, a pretty nice user guide, which provides the step-by-step -step instructions how to uh, use the tools. And you have option to download all the information that uh, we have generated, all the maps that are being generated number of researchers across the country are already using this information. I'm familiar with some work in Quebec and being contacted by colleagues from uh, British Columbia. And, uh, they are utilizing these maps to in order to um, do the analysis that they have interest in. You have also these cards that you can kind of, uh, instead of menu, quickly uh, look at the maps. Usually the process start by Reviewing, reviewing the maps. What you see is just a Google map of, of Canada. And um, here, I need to move this. Um, here are the kind of three key sources of all the information that's available. The first, uh, the first is the set of general maps. Uh, we have a digital elevation map on the kind of medium resolution, digital elevation map for Canada, high resolution, we have a drainage basis, and also the we added the postal code map or layer. So by simply selecting the area, you will get immediately the presentation of the, for example, digital elevation model. Over that model, you can, uh, for example, show the postal codes. And as you can see, this is a very detailed layer that <clears throat> provides the information, exact information about each of the postal codes. Um, you can use the higher resolution um, digital elevation model. And also you can overlay or uh, have the ability to show the major, major drainage basins in, in Canada. So these maps are something like a background maps that are <clears throat> providing necessary information to the users. Uh, we have here the legends for the digital elevation models. So the color scheme is converted into meters, so elevation, um, and you can use that, uh, that information too. The next two uh, options on the main menu are basically now options to show the flood maps generated by the methodology and flood maps created for kind of different, <clears throat> using different, uh, different input data. The current condition maps are those that are utilizing the, uh, the reanalysis information. If you overlay uh, the, you see your cursor over the map, it tells you um, this is a historical map, 25 uh, year return period flooding, created using the cl climate model, CMLP6 climate models. A uh, little bit further, you have for different return periods, these maps. A little bit further down, you have now for the reanalysis also the maps developed for 25, 50, 100 and so different return periods. When you select one of these options, uh, you actually get on screen um, the uh, flood inundation or the flood maps what I would like, if it's possible, to put London, city where I am at the moment, in the middle so that we can, so you can zoom in, obviously, and you can see, uh, you can see the extent of flooding. Basically, these are the cells one by one kilometer where the shade of blue um, is uh, providing the water depth. The interesting feature that we have added is that we can make these transparent so that you can actually now see where, uh, at what location, <clears throat> and what is uh, exposed to this kind of flood hazard. Uh, by what I think it's uh, very important is here that 
This is downtown London, where the North Thames and South Thames join into Thames and then flow down to the lakes. Uh, by simply clicking on any location, you obtain the information that is presented on the screen, coordinates of the location. And in this case, I'm showing only the flood map uh, for 25 year return period, historical period, based on the North American reanalysis and the water depth in this location. Um, <clears throat> we can combine that with the, with the, <clears throat> let's say, digital elevation model and make this transparent. And now you will have uh, additional information that's uh, basically the elevation, which is picked up from the digital elevation model at that particular location. If we add uh, another layer, like a postal code, uh, this is obviously very crowded now, downtown area and postal codes are relatively small areas. Clicking on the particular location now will give you more coordinates, will give you the digital elevation, will give you the exact postal code, and will give you the water depth that corresponds to the map of 25 year return period for the North American reanalysis. What can be done here is interesting. Um, we combine the open street maps, uh, which is uh, basically the layer that captures the buildings and the infrastructure. So you will have opportunity to kind of go to the layer um, and identify the at the particular location at the particular uh, at the particular. Uh, building what the water elevation is. Here is the Western Muir University. Here are the kind of uh, areas, as you can see, that are kind of exposed to. Um, I forgot to mention when I was discussing the methodology that we didn't include the protection uh, measures. Uh, these are the kind of natural conditions and many locations you know, within the city are protected with different infrastructure like uh, uh, in downtown area, we have a flood wall on one side of the uh, North Thames and um, along the North Thames, we have a dikes, uh, we have a, a reservoir just outside of the city, which is also providing some protection. So uh, the impact of this protection structure can be analyzed by introducing them in and seeing the reduction, but that was not that was not done here. These are the kind of natural conditions what will happen. So you clicking on the university, you will see that there is a potential that some of the buildings which are close to the river uh, uh, be can be flooded in the case of large floods. Okay, uh, similar procedure will be to look at the uh, to look at the uh, future conditions. Normally now we have a much larger uh, much larger set of maps. As you recall, we had uh, we have <clears throat> different the same return periods: 25, 50, uh, 100, 150, 200, 300, and 500. But we have two. Um, emission scenarios, uh, the mid-range and the high, so SSP2 and SSP5, and then we have three different time periods. So if you just put the cursor up, it will give you immediately what the map includes. It includes, in this case, the near future, 2020 to 2060, uh, uh, the SSP2 scenario, 400-year return period. Um, and and this is now available. This is now available for all mentioned return periods, uh, time periods, and and uh, <clears throat> emission scenarios. Uh, these are obviously very similar kind of results in a sense that you see uh, the areas in blue. These areas are going obviously to be larger depending on what scenario you are observing. And kind of clicking at the elevation, you will find uh, you will find what uh, is the consequence or water depth or water hazard. Okay, so so these are just the presentations, visual presentations of the maps. I think they were quite useful. Many people were contacting me. I even got the phone call from a lady from Alberta that was very much interested to find out should she buy the house 
the particular location. So he, she was asking for my advice, you know, and I tried to explain that these maps uh, are not, you know, for making decisions so at this level, but they can be informative or telling you what the potential uh, exposure to a particular location, location is. Uh, this information can be uh, downloaded. And you you click on the downloads, you will see that you know all these different maps are now available, and the full file can be straight uh, downloaded from the uh, from our website. But you have also option um, to uh, select the area. Just a second. Ah, I pressed twice and okay. So you have option that you can now select the area and say, okay, I'm just interested at this particular location where the confluence. I don't want all these big files and so many different information. And if you can now go into the downloads. You will see a little bit changed, um, changed kind of format. You have now two options that you can download all the maps for the full, for the country, as well as only the maps for the clipped, uh, for the clipped area. I think this is you know neat feature if you're you know really interested in a much smaller areas that you can focus and reduce the size of the uh, files and all the you know necessary all the necessary. Uh, computational consequences of very large, very large files. So this will be the way of utilizing this information or using the information. I would like to kind of walk you quickly through uh, the learning um, feature where you have now the information about the project, um, you know, software being used, uh, methodology, as well as all the data. Uh, the, all the scenarios are described here and information fully provided. The references are also available. Uh, there are a number of publications that came out. And also the source uh, of the information, data information, especially the, the reanalysis re data, as well as uh, the data, other data, public data that we used in development of these maps. Uh, as you can see, also the 17 models that I uh, mentioned are identified, the references related to them are also provided. So uh, I think pretty good source of uh, building the understanding of what the maps are showing and what the maps can be kind of used for. These are the references and they're all provided in downloadable form for the users. Um, and the final feature I didn't touch is the user guide. And user guide is nothing else than basically captured what I tried to do by this live demonstration. Um, it's starting with you know opening the opening the maps, uh, using the menus, identifying what the each menu um, is uh, offering you with, um, how you can clip the data, how you can download the information. And what uh, what you can do, and how and what the format for the download and information uh, is. So this will be a very, uh, I think, brief uh, uh, review of the information uh, of the tool that we built to. Um, just a second, uh, tool that we built to. Um, make our work more applicable to general to general public. I'm back into my presentation just to use once more the, uh, the kind of conclusion slide. Um, repeat that we use the latest climate information in this particular work, that we used two periods. I am sorry, this slide is not updated. But we used, you know, six different return periods from 25 to 500 years, and we also uh, uh, did show through some of the uh, maps that I selected to show 
uh, that flood frequency in the far future will increase in different regions of the country to different level, faster northern parts and few more in the eastern parts are really going to expose to much higher blood hazard. All the information uh, about the methodology, development of the methodology and the application of the methodology to kind of analyze the impact on the population are within this, you know, five papers or publications that are all available to those who are interested. And any additional resources are available on my personal website, that means papers and uh, on the methodological aspects that are linked to what these maps are uh, also showing. Let me finish my presentation. I hope I didn't take too much time uh, with one coming opportunity. Uh, yes, it is kind of far away, but it's also time flies and it's coming fast. On uh, May 20 to 22 in 2026, we are organizing at uh, University of Western Ontario uh, host uh, 10th International Conference on Flood Management hosted by the Faculty of Engineering and Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction that I am serving as the Director of Engineering Works. And we'll be looking into adapting to global change and various innovative approaches to flood management and resilience. The, the conference website is already active. Uh, you can very easily pre-register without any obligation, but that will give you opportunity to receive the information that will be coming as we pro proceed towards the conference. With this, I would thank you for your attention and um, I will be very happy to respond to questions or comments that you may have. Thank you for that great presentation and thank you for everyone for submitting your questions to me. If you still think of any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll read them out uh, in a moment and we can go through as many as we can. Um, but quickly before we jump into the q and I wanted to let you know about our survey. So Monica will drop the link in the chat. If you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes to fill out our survey, it just lets us know what you enjoyed about today and topics that you're interested in, in learning about in the future. And... I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, go oh. ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. I thought this was the question. <laughs> oh, no, just a quick survey first and I'll jump into the questions now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first question I have is what can homeowners do to prepare their properties against potential future flooding? This is a, this is a very good question, and the answer is um, answer is not kind of straightforward. The main reason is that you know each location each location may require different um, different adaptation measures and you know approaches to be implemented. I think the first step is definitely to get. Uh, full understanding of the exposure or the hazard. And the lecture and the presentation and the work that I introduced was really aimed in that direction, that we can kind of find out what the flood hazard is at different locations, that we can look into various future climate scenarios and see how this uh, exposure will change. That will be the starting point. And then from that point on, you have a various options. And obviously, some options are at the individual level of you know trying to organize the house in a different way, depending where you are in the uh, in the floodplain, uh, or use some external measures to protect, like a smaller uh, flood walls or you know flood protection measures. Uh, there are tons of uh, tons of different measures that can be applied. Um, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction is very much, very much focused on providing assistance to homeowners. So I would strongly encourage, you know, visiting the site. Uh, um, it's simply uh, iclr.org and downloading the, uh, you know, many, many uh, information that's available for the for the homeowners. Flooding can be of a different nature. I mean, there is a backup flooding that may be, you know, coming from the inf infrastructure and location of the building within the city where the infrastructure is not sufficient to provide the protection. 
or it may be simply exposure to overland flooding that comes from the river that spills the water over the banks. Yeah. So in these different cases, different measures make more or less sense. Perfect. And we'll also be including an educational handout in the email that we send with the webinar recording. So I'll make sure to include those resources in there so everyone can find them later on. And the next question is from someone that's interested in knowing where flood forecasting mapping might be available. And they asked, is there a way to know the anticipated highest water level so one can ensure their residence is above that level? Um, okay, so flood forecasting is a separate uh, separate area, and uh, I, you know, what we were talking today is not directly directly related. Um, um, I, therefore, I would I would simply postpone that answering that question because I think you need to you need to focus on a very different methodology, inputs, data, and sharing this information. The second part of the question, if I understand, is is there a way of finding out what is the highest elevation, or is that yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yes, this is what this is what the floodplain uh, mapping is for. Uh, there, there are different uh, there are different scales at which the floodplain mapping is being done. Uh, what I was talking today is a global scale, so looking the whole country and understanding you know where are the areas of high risk lower risk and uh, what will be happening in the future under this scenario or that scenario the next level is a regional level when you will be using a little bit more uh, uh, data detailed data detailed information so that you can at the regional scale answer the question uh, that means the highest elevation uh, it's it we are usually not looking for the highest elevation what we are usually using are the statistical kind of distribution as you know i was mentioning 2500 year uh, 500 year map and so on that means uh, that let's say for the design of a particular infrastructure the standard is to use the you know flood elevation that corresponds to you know 100 year return period this is how we design dikes and so on. If you are talking about pipes that should be carrying the drainage system pipes, it should be carrying the water, we usually use the uh, uh, shorter, we use 25 year return period and so on. So yes, the answer is yes, we can um, assess this statistically and this information is used within the municipalities, within the provinces and even on the federal level to either decide uh, and uh, and govern the land use, especially and the development in the areas that may be exposed to the uh, hazard or flood hazards. And the next question I have here is: uh, um, resistance to designating flood zones seem to be growing from the private sector and insurance companies who are refusing mortgage insurance. What can be done in the wake of this? Uh, can you repeat the beginning of the question? Yeah, so they were just commenting about how there's resistance to designating flood zones. Um, uh -huh. And that seems to be coming from the private sector and insurance companies who are refusing mortgage insurance. And they're just wondering what can be done. Uh Oh, okay, so uh, this is a very this is a very good question and relatively complex uh, question to answer. The responsibility for for flood management uh, is um, handled by different provinces in Canada different ways. Uh, if you look at Ontario, uh, we have conservation authorities, and conservation authorities are you know primary. They, this is primary responsibility. Of the conservation authorities to identify what are the floodplains, delineate the floodplains, and then there are you know rules that are kind of created together with the province. Uh, what will be developed or what will be uh, uh, allowed to be developed and located in these areas? Just a, an example: the hundred-year return period floodplains are fully should be. Uh, fully left to the river, no development allowed. 250, which is a wider area around uh, around the rivers, can be developed up to a certain level. 
with the special approvals that come from the municipalities and conservation authorities together. So um, the, 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 the way how the insurance come is, comes into that picture is simply related to the implementation of these criteria, decision criteria. So if you are located in the flood plain, uh, um, insurance is very hesitant to provide um, uh, to provide uh, um, ways of you know or the cost of the the cost of the insurance will be extremely high. Um, if you are if you are close to the uh, um, river in the areas let's say to 250 for for Ontario in other provinces it's a different criteria. Uh, then insurance is nowadays providing uh, providing some ways, and uh, um, you can buy different uh, different insurance. The small problem that we are seeing now is that the insurance is not fully fully kind of regulated across uh, across the country. You have a situation where the companies are deciding, different insurance companies are deciding what will be the level and how they are going to, or what type of product they are going to uh, uh, provide and what will be the cost of it. So uh, if anyone is interested, my suggestion is simply to investigate what for your particular location, different insurance companies are uh, considering or making available. I am sure that there are locations where the insurance companies will not be touching or providing any, any insurance because of the very high level of exposure and simply inability to come, you know, to, to, to kind of uh, cover the cost. Uh, in, in insurance is the mechanism to share the risk. And very often the insurance companies are in Canada complaining that we have a small population, very large country, and that for the cost, you know, the cost of flooding uh, or flood insurance is very high. Now, with the more common, uh, more common flooding, uh, more frequent flooding, and increase in the magnitude, they are seeing that the situation and the picture is changing, and many of the insurance companies are getting now into the uh, into providing different uh, different products for for insure you know for insurance against flood. And someone is wondering if you have any advice for enacting new bylaws that provide restrictions on work on existing structures, um, specifically on properties now designated as lying on a floodplain. Properties on the floodplain, is that what you were saying? Yeah, someone's just wondering if you have any advice for enacting new bylaws that provide restrictions on work on existing structures and their specifically yeah. properties on the this is plane. the this is a very this is a very significant uh, very significant significant question and i think it's a uh, definitely the the responsibility of those who are providing uh, you know who are responsible for flood management uh, the 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 floodplains are dynamic they're changing. And I think the maps that I am providing here are showing that. If you look at the current conditions and compare the conditions with the you know, future climate uh, change under any scenario, you will see the increase. So some of the properties that today are not in a flood bay may be in the floodplains of the future. So therefore, should be some kind of mechanism how to deal, uh, how to deal with this particular uh, question. Um, I um, I know that in in many cases in many cases we don't want to talk about getting out of the floodplains, but I, yeah, I I strongly advocate actually that we should start that dialogue. The floodplains should be left to the river. Many countries in Europe, uh, Netherlands, Germany, I'm not sure what was another one that I found out. Uh, they, they have a very, very uh, sophisticated programs for moving the people out of the floodplain. Called, the program is called the leaving the space for the river and simply buying the properties and moving the uh, uh, people out of the floodplain is the primary responsibility. 
uh, in Germany, you have rivers which were totally channelized in order for you know to provide to provide for the navigation in early days. Most of the cities were developed a very close proximity of the water because of that. And nowadays, what they are doing, they are you know rich enough that they can do that. They are now getting rid of these dikes and letting uh, actually river to more naturally inundate the areas across and moving the properties, moving the people out of these areas because they are finding the flood damage or the expense expenses that are being uh, introduced by more frequent and higher magnitude flooding is far exceeding the cost of you know, removing, <laughs> removing and releasing the floodplains from the pressure of the development. And just one last question here. It says, do hydro dams and generating stations that change flow velocity frequently affect the modeling system? Do, sorry, didn't hear. Can you repeat the question slower, please? Sure, so it says, do hydro dams and generating stations that uh -huh. change uh -huh. flow velocity frequently affect the modeling system. Yeah, okay. Um, everything depends on the basically basically location. Uh, the, the dams are obstacles for flow and hydropower stations, which are usually associated with dams, are uh, utilizing or releasing the water, changing the distribution of flow in time. Uh, by changing the distribution of flow in time, uh, you are definitely affecting the flood conditions downstream, uh, downstream from the dam. So yes, the, 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 they are affecting. However, if the flooding is a significant issue for the regions downstream, I think uh, so-called the multi-purpose operation of these facilities is being considered in order to kind of provide the positive effect of storing the water behind the dam during the periods when you have high flows and then releasing the water during the periods uh, when you have low, low flows. That does change the hydropower production. However, the benefits uh, and the costs are shared between these two different purposes related to this piece of infrastructure. So um, we do have methods and methodologies how to do that. And there are a number of, number of um, hydropower dams that also include as one of the purposes, flood protection. All right, I think we'll wrap up our Q&A there because it's time. Thanks again for everyone for tuning in to our webinar today. Um, don't forget to quickly fill out that survey and sign up for our upcoming webinar. And I hope that everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you.